So what's the weather been like in your life the past year? That may seem like a strange question. But what's the weather been like in your life this past year? If you're like most of us, it's been stormy. I went in to see the family physician. He said, Dan, how are you doing? I said, well, I'll tell you the honest truth, Doc. I've been fighting depression. And he said, I don't blame you. Thanks, Doc, for the encouragement. <laughs> but uh, he's exactly right. We have every reason in what we have faced this past year to battle depression. Some have battled COVID. Some of us have lost family members. Some of us have lost friends. Some have lost jobs and, and some have suffered financial hardship. Some of us have been hit by a truck and our lives will never be the same again. As a Christian, how do we face the storms of life and still have hope in spite of everything going on around us and everything happening to us? Well, today we're going to look at a story in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, and seek to find an answer to that question. But first, let's get a little bit of background in the Gospel of Mark before we get into our story. So far in the Gospel of Mark, uh, the question has been, who is Jesus? And as you know, if you've been listening to me for any time at all, what do I say is the most important question to ask when you begin to open your Bible and begin to read the Scripture? Who is Jesus? So that's the question so far in the Gospel of Mark. Well, so far, Jesus has been shown as one having authority. Authority over sickness. Authority over disease, over sin, over the cosmic forces of evil. Satan and his demons. He has authority as the Son of God, the Messiah, the King, the Lord over all creation. So in our story today, we're going to see that Jesus is Lord over nature and Lord over the lives of his followers. So let's begin in Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Now Jesus had just been teaching in parables and he went out into a boat uh, just off the shore because thousands were thronging around him and to get a little space, uh, he actually got into a boat and he pushed off a bit into the lake and he spoke and taught the multitudes in parables from the boat. So that's where we pick up the scene. This has been going on all day long. Verse 35. That day when evening came, now, do you know when the fishermen went out on the Sea of Galilee to do the fishing? Can you imagine what time of day it was? Nighttime. They fished at night, uh, usually early evening or early morning, but during the night. So it's time to go fishing. <laughs> so the day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. That. Well, they were at Capernaum. And Capernaum is a city on the north northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. The fishing village. And they were in the lake, right on the shore at that time. And he said, let's go across. Now, what he probably meant by that was sailing east across the really the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee to the east side of the lake, and we're going to find uh, later on in Mark that that's where he ends up with his disciples. So he, he wasn't going across the middle of the lake, but he was going across a significant portion of the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. I say sea, lake. Uh, it's often called a sea. It wasn't a sea. It was a lake. It was fresh water where they did fish. Anybody know the kind of fish they caught in the Sea of Galilee? It's the kind of fish, generally, there are several different kinds, but basically the, the main crop was what today we would call tilapia. So the next time you have a tilapia, you think of the Sea of Galilee and the Galilean fishermen out there in the lake catching tilapia. 
So he said, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. So Jesus had spent, okay, listen to this. He has spent the whole day in that boat. Not a big boat, fair size, enough to go fishing on the lake in. But he spent the whole day in that boat teaching. And now it's evening, and he says, let's go across to the other side. Quite a little journey in that boat, and it's getting dark, the sun is set, it's evening time. So Jesus just stays in the boat, and the twelve get in with him, and thirteen of them go rowing, probably, unless there was a, a breeze for the sail, but generally rowing across the lake. So leaving the crowd behind, they took him away, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Now, we know he's going to run into a storm, but we don't know what's going to happen to those other boats. What, what happened to the other boats? Mark, please, why don't you tell us what? Well, Mark's not interested in what happened to those other boats. Maybe they saw the storm coming and they headed back to shore. Or maybe they said, he's headed to the east side. We hear there are tombs and strange things going on out there. And I don't think we want to follow. I don't know. But they disappear from the storm. Well, verse 37, a furious squall, that is, a windstorm, came up, and the waves broke over, hurled over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Now, some of them have fished on this lake all their lives. That's their profession. But this is a serious enough storm that even experienced fishermen are scared. And they're afraid the boat is going to be swamped, and they're going to be in the middle of the lake, and they're going to die. So a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern. Everybody know what the stern is? Boats? Navy vets here? you got the bow in the back, and the stern is in the front. So he's in the front of the boat. Now in the front of the boat was where the lead person or the most notable person of the crew, captain you might say, would sit. There was a little seat evidently in the front of those fishing boats in the stern. And the captain or whoever was leading the group would go there and could sit. And they often kept a cushion there to sit on. Well what we find here in our story is that Jesus is there in the stern and he's Sleeping on the cushion. If you need the cushion, probably for a pillow. So Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. He was worn out. He had just taught the crowds, thousands, all day long, sitting in that boat. And now he's still in that boat, but he's exhausted. He remembered Jesus, fully human, and he's tired. And he falls asleep. Not even the storm with the waves splashing in can't wake him up. Now that's, that's time. The disciples woke him. They roused him up and said to him, Teacher, didaskalos in Greek, uh, often referred to in Jewish society as rabbi. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now that's Kind of disrespectful, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> you know, they could have said, Jesus, wake up, please, we're all scared. Help yeah. us. No. No, they didn't say that. They said, have you ever said this silently or under your breath or in your thoughts? God, don't you care about it? Don't you care? Don't you care what's going on in my life? Where are you? I need you. You're not there. You don't care. That's the way they felt. Maybe sometimes that's the way we feel when things happen to us in this life. Let me give you a little bit of marital counseling. This is free, no extra charge. <laughs> Spill this in right here. 
Don't say it, you. Say I. What you say to your spouse? You never helped me. I don't think you care about me. Sometimes I don't think you love me. You don't help me bring in the groceries. You make me do all the cleaning. You hurt my feelings. I don't like the way you treat me. I don't think you love me. I don't think you ever did. Uh, that's emotional manipulation. It's wrong. It's hurtful. It's damaging. It doesn't do any good to say things like that. In fact, it's just harmful. You know what you should say? Sometimes I feel like this. Sometimes I feel unloved. Now, if you say that to your spouse, sometimes I feel unloved. They're going to say, what are they going to say? They're probably going to say, oh, honey, you know I love you. Now, that's a good experience. That's what you're looking for. So don't go, you, you, you. Go, I feel, I think, or, or what you said, I want you to know, hurt my feelings. Just let me give you some good advice. That's going to get you through some things. But if you come off like the disciples and say, Jesus, you don't even care about us, do you? Well, you're probably not going to get a very good response. Does that say no extra charge? Good counsel. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, does this sound like they knew who Jesus was? I mean, so far as I said, the whole story of Mark is talking about who is Jesus and his authority, and they've seen him do miracles. They've seen him uh, cast out demons. And yet, when their lives are involved and it's personal, that all goes out the window, and they think he doesn't care. I'm just saying something for all of us to think about in our relationship with God. So verse 39. He got up. He awoke. He rebuked the wind and said, rebuked the waves, and he said, quiet! Shut up! Stop it! Be still! These are the same words that Jesus would say to demons, which is interesting. And the demons responded, and guess what? The wind and the waves respond as well to the commands of Jesus to be quiet, to be still. Then the wind died down, the wind dropped, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Why are you so cowardly? Why are you so timid? Do you still have no faith? If you've ever been a teacher, some of you have been, or as parents or whatever, or grandparents, we work with children or whatever, and we teach them, we work with them, show them things, we model with them, and then the test comes and they get a zero. So verse 41, they were terrified and they asked each other, they kept on asking each other, who is this? Oh, come on. 
<laughs> Who is this? You still are asking that question? Who is this? Yeah. Jerry! Jerry, my, my, my head dryer ruined the picture. I know I need another one or I can't get back into the Forbidden City. <laughs> Who is this? Jerry! Yeah. Jerry! The Japanese guys had sake in the hot tub. You gotta get them out of the drawers and get them down here or I don't have a focus group to sell the pilot to Japanese TV. Uncle Leo? <laughs> Jerry! Hello. Jerry, Jerry, I'm trapped under my desk. Steinburn is in the room, you gotta help me. Who is this? Jerry! Hello? Elaine, you gotta get back down to the dealer. Putty is screwing me on this car, which is yellow now. Who is this? Elaine! Even the wind and the waves obey him. Well, who would the wind and waves obey? The one who created them. The creator. The Lord of heaven and earth. And the disciples are like shocked, like, this is Jesus. We hang out. Been with him all day. He got tired. He fell asleep. <laughs> he created <laughs> he, It was hard for them to accept and hard for them to understand. He is the Lord of heaven. You know, in telling this story, Mark knew that it would provide encouragement and hope for the persecuted Christians in the city of Rome for whom he wrote. The Gospel of Mark was probably written for Christians in the city of Rome, and they were going through some uh, incredibly severe persecution at that time. And I know that Mark, as he penned this story, uh, knew it would help them. Now, if you've noticed in that, I hope you did notice, this appears to be an eyewitness account, doesn't it? It's someone who was there describing what happened and what they saw what was going on. Mark wasn't there. Now, according to tradition, Mark worked with the Apostle Peter. And even in Rome, he worked with Peter. And I would say that there's a strong possibility that Peter, who was there, told Mark the story. And now Mark is remembering it and writing it down because he knows that for the church, that he serves in Rome, that's going through this severe trial, this story is going to help. It's going to give them hope. It's going to give them encouragement. We all go through the storms of life. And some of us go through some very powerful storms. We find ourselves torn and tattered by the storms of life, by the trials in our lives. And as with the disciples, we are prone to ask, Jesus, where are you? Are you asleep and don't know what's happening to me? Don't you care? God has not promised His people freedom from storms. In fact, Jesus stated that his followers would indeed suffer storms and would have to endure the storms of life. But what God has promised is never to leave nor forsake us in those storms. In fact, during the storm is when he is the closest to us, whether we perceive that. He has promised to comfort us and to strengthen us. He's promised this eternal life and glory with Him no matter what. And in His great mercy and by His great grace, you know, He often intervenes in our storms and stills them. But whatever the outcome, Jesus is awake, and He knows what's going on. And He is with us always, and He stands, as He did with Stephen, when He was dying, the 
hands of the Jewish mob who was stoning him to death. And Jesus stands at the right hand of God, our intercessor and our Savior. God is in charge. He rules over all things, including your life and mine. And as Christians, we can take comfort and hope that no matter what happens to us in this present life, we have a hope in heaven that surpasses all we could ever imagine. And it is ours, for sure, for all eternity. No matter what, no matter what the storm, the anchor of our soul, Jesus. You know the anchor was the earliest symbol Christians used to represent Jesus when they wanted to write messages and not let uh, other persecutors know exactly what they were talking about and they referred to Jesus, they would use the symbol of an anchor. It was only probably 100 more years later before the cross actually came into use as a symbol for Christianity. One of the original symbols was the fish and the anchor. And the author of Hebrews calls Jesus the anchor of our souls. The anchor of our souls always holds in spite of the storm. Now you might say, well, that sounds like that could be a song. Yes, it is. The Anger Holes is one of my favorite songs. It's, it's meant a lot to me in the stories of my life. It was written about, uh, oh, I think 1992 or so by Lawrence Schooning. Lawrence Schooning was a pastor. And one year in his life as a pastor, his father died. His family all experienced serious health problems. The church he pastored, people got angry with each other, and they split, and the church fell apart. Causing him to evaluate his calling as a pastor, even as a Christian. His wife had her third miscarriage, and he held his tiny 14-week-old fetus in his hands as it died. He spent the rest of the year in grief and sorrow and depression. But he began to write and play a few chords on the piano. And the words that came out of his sorrow made into a song. And the song was called The Anchor Bones. I wish I could sing it but we would have a mass exodus. <laughs> <laughs> so I will read the lyrics. And remember, this is the year of the major storm in Lawrence Chimes. And he wrote, I have journeyed through the long dark night out on the open sea by faith alone, sight unknown, and yet his eyes were watching. The anchor holds, though the ship is battered. The anchor holds, though the sails are torn. I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. I've had visions. I've had dreams. I've even held it in my hand. But I never knew they would slip right through like so many rains of sand. I've been young, but I'm older now. And there has been beauty that my eyes have seen. But it was in the night, through the storms of my life, that's when God proved his love to me. The anchor holds. 
though the ship is battered. The anchor holds, but the sails are torn. I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas, but the anchor holds, it's my storm. I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas, but the anchor holds. In spite of the storm. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> now, I hope you have your elements with you as we prepare the true communion. The Greek word is koinonia. It's often translated fellowship. It can be translated participation. But perhaps we know it well as communion. But that's what communion is. Fellowship with one another and with Jesus. Participation in the body and the blood and the spirit of Jesus. And with one another. We are told by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, and the Greek verb for give thanks is Eucharisteo, and from which we get the term for this ceremony as Eucharist, the giving of thanks. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you are skilled, you can feel this back. <laughs> and remove the bread. This is the body of Jesus given for us. The bread of life. The bread of heaven. In it we participate through the power of the Holy Spirit who makes present to us the body and the life of Jesus. Let us take the bread. Amen. The Apostle Paul continues, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Greek word for remembrance used here is anonesis, and it, it means to remember by reenacting. Not just by thinking about something, but by doing something that reenacts an event. And what we do every time we take communion together is we reenact that night that Jesus and his disciples ate their last supper together. This is the blood of the new covenant given for us through the power of the Spirit presents the life of Jesus to us. We participate in his life and we share in that life together in community. Let us take The Apostle Paul concludes his statements. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May God bless us as we participate in the life of Jesus Christ our Savior.